a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. The Bridge on the River Kwai The Bridge on the River Kwai is a 1957 British-American epic war film directed by David Lean and based on the novel La Ponde de la Rivière Kwai by Pierre Boulle. The film is a work of fiction that uses the historical setting of the construction of the Burma Railway in 1942-1943. The cast included William Holden, Jack Hawkins, and Alec Guinness and Seshu Hayakawa. It was initially scripted by screenwriter Carl Foreman, who was later replaced by Michael Wilson. Both writers had to work in secret, as they were on the Hollywood blacklist and had fled to England in order to continue working. As a result, Bull, who did not speak English, was credited and received the Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. Many years later, Foreman and Wilson posthumously received the Academy Award. The film was widely praised, winning seven Academy Awards at the 30th Academy Awards. In 1997, the film was deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant and selected for preservation in the National Film Registry by the United States Library of Congress. It has been included on the American Film Institute's list of best American films ever made. In 1999, the British Film Institute voted The Bridge on the River Kwai the 11th greatest British film of the 20th century. Many historical inaccuracies in the film have often been noted by eyewitnesses to the building of the real Burma Railway and historians. Plot in early 1943, British POWs arrived by train at a Japanese prison camp in Burma. The Commandant, Colonel Sato, informs them that all prisoners, regardless of rank, are to work on the construction of a railway bridge over the River Kwai that will connect Bangkok and Rangoon. The senior British officer, Lieutenant Colonel Nicholson, informs Sato that the Geneva Conventions exempt officers from manual labor. He later informs his officers that he had no intention of attempting an escape and forbids them from doing so, not because it's supposedly impossible, as Sato claims, but because they had been ordered by headquarters to surrender, and an escape attempt could be seen as a treasonous defiance of orders. At the following morning's assembly, Nicholson orders his officers to remain behind when the enlisted men are sent off to work. Sato slaps him across the face with his copy of the conventions and threatens to have them shot but Nicholson refuses to back down. When Major Clipton, the British medical officer, intervenes, telling Sato there are too many witnesses for him to get away with murdering the officers, Sato leaves the officers standing all day in the intense tropical heat. That evening, the officers are placed in a punishment hut, while Nicholson is locked in an iron box. Meanwhile, three prisoners attempt to escape. Two are shot dead. But United States Navy Commander Shears gets away, although badly wounded. He stumbles into a village of natives who nurse him back to health, and then help him leave by boat. Nicholson refuses to compromise. Meanwhile, the prisoners are working as little as possible, and sabotaging whatever they can. Should Sato fail to meet his deadline, he would be obliged to commit ritual suicide. Desperate. Sato uses the anniversary of Japan's victory in the Russo-Japanese War as an excuse to save face and announces a general amnesty, releasing Nicholson and his officers from manual labor. Nicholson conducts an inspection and is shocked by the poor job being done by his men. Over the protests of some of his officers, he allows Captain Reeves and Major Hughes to design and build a proper bridge, despite its military value, to the Japanese, for the sake of maintaining his men's morale. The Japanese engineers had chosen a poor site, so the original construction is abandoned and a new bridge is begun downstream. Shears is enjoying his hospital stay in Ceylon with a beautiful nurse, when British Major Warden informs him that the US Navy has transferred him over to the British to join a commando mission to destroy the bridge before it's completed. Shears is appalled at the idea of returning to a place from which he nearly died during escape. He confesses he is not an officer, but merely had appropriated an officer's uniform prior to his capture, expecting that this revelation will invalidate the transfer order. However, Warden responds he already knew the truth, and tells Shears that the American Navy's desire to avoid dealing with the embarrassment of his actions is the very reason they agreed to his transfer. Assured that he will be allowed to retain the privileges of being an officer and accepting that he actually has no choice, Shears relents and volunteers for the mission. The commando team consists of four men. Meanwhile, Nicholson drives his men hard to complete the bridge on time. 
For him, its completion will exemplify the ingenuity and hard work of the British Army for generations, long after the war's end. When he asks that their Japanese counterparts join in as well, a resigned Sato replies that he has already given the order. The commandos parachute in, with one man killed on landing, leaving three to complete the mission. Later, Warden is wounded in an encounter with a Japanese patrol and has to be carried on a litter. He, Shears, and Canadian Lieutenant Joyce reach the river in time with the assistance of Siamese women bearers and their village chief, Kun Yai. Under cover of darkness, Shears and Joyce plant explosives on the bridge towers below the waterline. A train carrying soldiers and important dignitaries is scheduled to be the first use of the bridge the following day, so Warden waits to destroy both. However, at daybreak the commandos are horrified to see that the water level has dropped, exposing the wire connecting the explosives to the detonator. Making a final inspection, Nicholson spots the wire and brings it to Saito's attention. As the train is heard approaching, they hurry down to the riverbank to investigate. The commandos are shocked that their own man is about to uncover the plot. Joyce, manning the detonator, breaks cover and stabs Sato to death. Aghast, Nicholson yells for help, while attempting to stop Joyce from reaching the detonator. As he wrestles with Nicholson, Joyce tells Nicholson that he is a British officer under orders to destroy the bridge. When Joyce is shot dead by Japanese fire, Shears swims across the river, but is fatally wounded as he reaches Nicholson. Recognizing the dying Shears, Nicholson exclaims, What have I done? Warden fires his mortar, mortally wounding Nicholson. The dazed colonel stumbles towards the detonator and collapses on the plunger just in time to blow up the bridge and send the train hurtling into the river below. Witnessing the carnage, Clifton shakes his head muttering, Madness. Madness. Screenplay The screenwriters, Carl Foreman and Michael Wilson, were on the Hollywood blacklist and, even though living in exile in England, could only work on the film in secret. The two did not collaborate on the script. Wilson took over after Lean was dissatisfied with Foreman's work. The official credit was given to Pierre Boulle, and the resulting Oscar for Best Screenplay was awarded to him. Only in 1984 did the Academy rectify the situation by retroactively awarding the Oscar to Foreman and Wilson, posthumously in both cases. Subsequent releases of the film finally gave them proper screen credit. David Lean himself also claimed that producer Sam Spiegel cheated him out of his rightful part in the credits, since he had had a major hand in the script. The film was relatively faithful to the novel, with two major exceptions. Shears, who is a British commando officer like Warden in the novel, became an American sailor who escapes from the POW camp. Also, in the novel, the bridge is not destroyed, the train plummets into the river from a secondary charge placed by Warden, but Nicholson does not fall onto the plunder, and the bridge suffers only minor damage. Boole nonetheless enjoyed the film version though he disagreed with its climax. Casting Lawrence Olivier was offered the part of Colonel Nicholson, but turned it down in order to direct The Prince and the Showgirl. He later said that it was a sensible decision to go off and do love scenes with Marilyn Monroe rather than duke it out, with Lean in the jungles of Ceylon. Spiegel persuaded Spencer Tracy to play Nicholson, but Tracy, who was American like Spiegel, and had read the book, emphatically told him that the part should be played by an Englishman. Lean offered Charles Lawton the part of Nicholson. But Lawton later refused, deciding that he couldn't handle the heat of Ceylon and the somewhat warlike, militant nature of the story. Ronald Coleman, Ray Milland, Noel Coward and James Mason were among the actors that were considered to replace Lawton in the role. Alec Guinness, who had worked with Lean on Oliver Twist, eventually got the role. Spiegel approached Cary Grant for the part of Shears. Grant had read the book and was interested in playing Shears, but admitted having hemmed and hawed too much over script changes and the fact that he would have to go to Salon to shoot the film. Spiegel also approached Humphrey Bogart, who died before the film's release. Rock Hudson was also considered, but he turned the down role to star in A Farewell to Arms. Montgomery Clift was considered for the role of either Shears or Joyce. Spiegel offered him a role in the film at a dinner which went horribly wrong due to Clift's poor health condition on account of drug use. Filming Many directors were considered for the project, among them, John Ford, William Wyler, Howard Hawks, Fred Zinnemann, and Orson Welles. The film was an international co-production between companies in Britain and the United States. 
director David Lean clashed with his cast members on multiple occasions, particularly Alec Guinness and James Donald, who thought the novel was anti-British. Lean had a lengthy row with Guinness over how to play the role of Nicholson. Guinness wanted to play the part with a sense of humor and sympathy, while Lean thought Nicholson should be a bore. On another occasion, Lean and Guinness argued over the scene, where Nicholson reflects on his career in the army. Lean filmed the scene from behind Guinness, and exploded in anger, when Guinness asked him why he was doing this. After Guinness was done with the scene, Lean said, Now you can all fuck off and go home. You English actors. Thank God that I'm starting work tomorrow with an American actor. The film was made in Ceylon, the bridge in the film was near Kichilgala. Alec Guinness later said that he subconsciously based his walk while emerging from, the oven on that of his 11-year-old son Matthew, who was recovering from polio at the time, a disease that left him temporarily paralyzed. From the waist down, Guinness later reflected on the scene, calling it the finest piece of work he had ever done. Lee nearly drowned when he was swept away by the river current during a break from filming. The filming of the bridge explosion was to be done on 10 March 1957, in the presence of SWRD Bandaranaika then Prime Minister of Ceylon, and a team of government dignitaries. However, cameraman Freddie Ford was unable to get out of the way of the explosion in time, and Lean had to stop filming. The train crashed into a generator on the other side of the bridge and was wrecked. It was repaired in time to be blown up the next morning, with Bandaranaika and his entourage present. The producers nearly suffered a catastrophe following the filming of the bridge explosion. To ensure they captured the one-time event, Multiple cameras from several angles were used. Ordinarily, the film would have been taken by boat to London, but due to the Suez Crisis this was impossible. Therefore the film was taken by air freight. When the shipment failed to arrive in London, a worldwide search was undertaken. To the producer's horror the film containers were found a week later on an airport tarmac in Cairo, sitting in the hot sun. Although it was not exposed to sunlight, the heat-sensitive color film stock should have been hopelessly ruined. However, when processed the shots were perfect and appeared in the film. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?